You ready? Yes, I was just checking something out. Um, fine. fine. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Right. Okay. okay. What... I have been around clergy people my whole life. And the the standard state of a clergy person is distracted. My <laughs> assumption is God is speaking to them at this exact moment. Yes, yes, yes true, Thou shalt true. not interrupt. That's yes, the thou shalt not interrupt the theophany. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to be sure. Three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode four ninety one. I'm Kevin Colson. I'm Gavin Ashen, and it's the 22nd of February 2019. Hello. Okay, let's get the program started before we even get, get anywhere on the road. Before you hear one word of news from us, please like the program, share the program, subscribe to the program, download the podcast to the program, uh, retweet and tweet the program. You know what to do by now. You guys are expert uh, listeners and viewers of Anglican Unscripted, and we do appreciate that. Where's George? Okay. We've had a real trying morning with technology in the Anglican TV studios. My uh, <clears throat> iMac from late 2014 gave up the ghost, and I was not prepared to uh, bring in my uh, newer computer and transfer everything over in time, so George timed out about noon, so he couldn't be here. He's doing altar guild stuff and, and church stuff, but I will have him on the program tomorrow. Gavin is back from his morning activities, and he's only here because he has a time gap of five hours, and uh, we can go well into his evening, and he's not really uh, upset until his his tummy goes dinner. And then I got to get, you know, her, hurry on and, and get these things going. Uh, which brings up another thing. If you would like to help donate to technology at Anglican TV Studios, you can do so by going to anglican.inc forward slash donate. Now, we like to talk about things that happen on the shores of England, and there's been a lot going on with the Church of England this week. You're having General Synod, and uh, the headlines of the BBC, and the Times, and the Sun, and the Church Times, and the, the headline today is, Church of England says no need to worry about doing Sunday services. Did I read that right? Well, you did. And it applies to an ancient rule, a very mm. good rule. That in canon law, every parish has to have uh, a service of worship uh, on Sundays and, on, on, uh, and also Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And so uh, that's just canon law. The, the, every parish is supposed to have an incumbent and the incumbent is supposed to open the church for the people. Um, what's changed is there aren't enough incumbents anymore to cover all the buildings. And so um, as, as the number of clergy have grown fewer, relative number of churches, in order to carry out canon law, clergy had to scuttle round. Now, they've stopped doing that. So recently, they basically have been in breach of canon law. And so General Synod said, what can we do about this? Let's change canon law so that they don't have to scuttle around and open up all the churches. So long as one church in the benefits. This may be English, but you're using the word scuttle. And yeah. when I think of scuttle, that means you take a ship out to sea and you sink it. Okay, now this, this, mean, <laughs> this means um, a, a rat on a hamster wheel going okay. right. push, 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 push. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know the Titanic we call the Church of England is sinking. I just didn't want to know if you're trying to Well, to in, a, that, in that a sense, perhaps it's scuttling too, because what it really means is these, these, are, these are empty churches without people or priests in them, mm. or with so few people in them. Uh, and effectively, the Church of England is slowly withdrawing into a rotor system, certainly. Well, everywhere, everywhere. In fact. Mm -hmm. The fact Justin Welby, bless his heart, he 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 did some as much spinning as he possibly could, and you know they're desperate. When at one point he said, "And we educate over a million children," well, uh, you know this means the Church of England has a number of schools, nominally has schools, yeah. but there's, not, there's no evidence at all that those children going to those schools get a Christian education in any sense of the word we would understand. Like, but what yeah, it, what, hold, hold on again, you're doing it again. Gavin, there is evidence they are not getting a Christian education. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, what's wrong with you today? You know, I just you, you I want to scuttle the church. And... <laughs> There's evidence they're getting a non-Christian one. Correct. But, but the point of it is not that whether how well the children are being educated. It's that mm. you know that if the Archbishop of Canterbury starts producing statistics like that, 
it's intended to bamboozle people, to throw dust in the eyes and to hide the real fact, which is that the Church of England is shrinking very badly indeed in terms of the numbers of people. Though they keep on saying that more clergy are coming forward, but the numbers of clergy are, of course, dropping considerably. Uh, and the clergy that are coming forward are largely uh, elderly, late middle-aged ladies who have decided in their late middle age to be useful and become priests. Um, and this is very good. They do messy church awfully well, um, but it isn't changing the direction of anything much. And, it, and uh, uh, so the Church of England in that sense is in trouble. And you know it's in trouble when the Archbishop says, we are educating more than a million children. It's a giveaway. Yes, it is. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, some comments he made during his presidential address. Um, he said it's time for General Synod, uh, certainly the, the clergy and bishops here, to stop being cynical. And when he says that, from what I'm getting, he means stop judging each other. We can all just agree to get along. Christianity is not that complicated. It's just love. The trouble Truth is... Truth and God... To, to let me finish here. <laughs> Go ahead. It's, I'm having a good day. <laughs> all technology has just left my desk. <laughs> Truth and love and uh, kumbaya and all the things that we remember from the 70s, that's the real uh, Christianity. And the, the church needs to stop holding other people and itself accountable. And I thought this would be a great time to talk about, you know, cynics and what it does to a church that doesn't have accountability. And this is a great opening for you. Thank you. A nice ball over the net, and that was a good roll. <laughs> Ace. You aced it. Go. <laughs> Let me try and amplify what you're saying. I want to begin by saying that because I'm now going to be critical, someone might say cynical, <laughs> um, I received there was an email I got about half an hour ago from uh, one of the bravest Christian women in the country, Andrea Mincello Williams. She runs a Christian legal center, and I think. Everyone knows I'm a great admirer of that organization and of her too. And she said, um, Synod is sick. It was just an email she sent out to half a dozen of us who pray for her there. She did her very best during questions to hold the bishops to account for the language and the standards they use. And you may remember that about uh, in last summer, they booed her. Uh, it, was, it was one of those moments when Somebody brave standing up, speaking the truth in love, uh, in a biblical sense, gets booed. You know then they don't mean the same things by truth or love. And that carries us on to the Archbishop's statement. So as one read it, um, the first thing is, what does he mean by the words? Um, by cynical, one would presume he means people asking questions in a damaging, destructive, negative kind of way. Actually, what he really means is, don't criticize me. Don't criticize what I stand for and bring to the table. That appears to be what cynical means from the context. The church has always asked questions. And of course, one of the things that he finds very difficult at the moment is that biblically orientated Christians are asking him questions he doesn't like. And he seems to have translated this in a fit of, if I should say, theological grumpiness into the accusation of being cynical. I'm sorry to say that, but I think, but I think it's true. And I'll say it with as much affection as I can possibly manage he must have a lot on his shoulders. He does. But, but the problem is, he then he then went on to give a very interesting address where he talked about truth and love. And as I read it, Kevin, I was impressed. I thought there's a lot of good Christian rhetoric here. And I mean that in a nice sense. This is quite exciting. But every so often, the wall, the wheels fall off. And I, I thought, what's going on here exactly? And of course, it soon becomes evident that what he means by love and what he means by truth. And then he threw in holiness quite a lot. And again, as soon as someone says holiness, I'm putty in their hands. Yeah. I go, yeah, you know, great. We are <laughs> called to be holy. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> but, but the trouble is, he doesn't, I think he means something like wholeness. Uh, there's always this, this constant sense of therapeutic language or therapeutic meaning. And so we're, we're back to this idea that the religion that he and the synod are practicing is by and large a form of moralistic therapeutic deism uh, so much of the time we are constant the, the the bishop of london i was reading in the church times today celebrated the diversity of london and said what are we called to do we are called to listen uh, as if that 
as if you know that's what Jesus what would Jesus do he listened no there is a great sense constantly we're coming back into a religion enclosed in therapy so when Justin Welby talks about holiness he doesn't mean what I mean by holiness and 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 I don't think he means what the Bible means by holiness at all and when he talks about love he certainly doesn't bring some of the uh, rigorous different meanings that you find in scripture and Christian tradition. He appears to, to, to mean essentially uh, uncritical, unfailing, positive regard for the other without any conditions. And therefore, therefore all this language sounds really impressive, but leads to a completely different destination. And more and more, I'm really sorry to say, it's a different religion. He's kind of stuck. Okay, we've had dozens of years of the primates meeting together and putting forth how to hold the Episcopal Church accountable. Putting forth, you know, this is what we do as primates. It's our job to hold one another accountable. Uh, it's been done at the province level. It's done at the uh, diocese level, the province, you know. And so he's to the point now where he thinks the only way forward for his church the Anglican Communion slash Church of England to survive is to sell a different type of love, a type mm. of love where there is no accountability. And in fact, if you want to hold somebody accountable, you're not really participating in love. And the and problem with the problem with the accountability issue is that behind that lies a form of of uh, anthropology, and the new anthropology that's taken over is this sexualized romanticization what i mean by that is uh, people want to i claim an identity that is not in christ but is all about an erotic romantic love ad addressed to whoever they want and so long as it's erotic and romantic uh, it, it gets a pass there is no accountability there is no definition and the church has decided that this secular understanding of humanity is the one they're going to buy into now the problem is that all the way through scripture and all the way through tradition uh, romantic love and erotic romantic love are taken as being really dangerous. Um, they are they are lures. They are other gods. They are to do with 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 satisfying something in the flesh and not just in the body sense, but in the in the Pauline sense of the lower self. And indeed, for 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 much of the Christian history, uh, Christians have understood romantic love and and the sexual expression of it to be so dangerous to the soul that many people have chosen to give it up altogether. Well, I can't go there. But, <laughs> you know, but people, uh, we hear what you're saying. <laughs> because it was seen as being a, a great trap. Um, now, one of the things that we've had to do is to try and tame it. And, of course, it gets tamed in marriage. Uh, in fact, it gets so tamed in marriage that people who have an appetite for it immediately go outside marriage in order... To, to get more of it. But the idea that you can buy into this secular understanding of human appetite and then Christianize it without any accountability or any sense that it, it sits oddly with biblical truth and Christian experience is, is very odd. But if you ask questions about it, you're being cynical. Yeah. So, you know, that's the point we're at now. Uh, now, what has been the reaction now to transgender baptism? Are they going to react now? <laughs> to sit it and... there some, so there's this wonderful tradition in Synod that people get to ask questions, and it's a bit of a game. Mm -hmm. uh, so people who are crossed with the bishops and crossed with the authorities try and ask questions to trap them. And one of the nicest, nicest one I heard was, so when are you going to, trans when are you going to produce a liturgy for people who's who have transgendered back again? <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a, a baptism liturgy for all of us then there's a baptism liturgy for people who've transgendered can we have one for one people who've transgendered back the, bat, the, the transgender yeah. regret people well yeah the retransition yes, is what we have to call it you know and of course this this irritated the people on the podium very much indeed because the, because for obvious reasons so the answer is that uh, um People have tried to hold the bishops to account for this really silly document. Uh, and they, they, they sidestepped. They said, well, you know, it's not meant to be uh, a new liturgy. It's just to allow people to express their new identity in Christ. They don't mean the new identity in Christ. They mean their new identity and then get Christ to pat them on the head and said, how do you feel about seeing yourself in this new way? Again, it's using the same words, but with an entirely different meaning. 
It's ironic because the church was pathetic in its response to um, homosexuality becoming more public in the 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, and on. Um, horrible response from the church. And now their response to that is another over-response in the wrong direction. The church can't seem to do anything right in response to people who suffer from these conditions. I think it's very difficult for a, a national church. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're seeking the approbation of the public, then there's every temptation to swallow the cultural norms as they're presented to you. It takes quite a lot of courage to to, uh, to do otherwise. So the Church Times is full of people uh, living at the edge of intersexuality, saying, why doesn't the church understand us better? Why doesn't it arrange its teaching and its cultural practice and its approbation around us? And of course, the answer is because when it comes to being in the image and the likeness of God, what the Holy Spirit is trying to do is to reorder us all. And the whole point of repentance and the sacraments and reading scripture and making our lives conform to the words of Jesus is that we are constantly having our sexual identity, our basic identity, our humanity operated on by the Holy Spirit. We don't tell him to conform himself to us. We ask him to conform us. And it's this sense that they've got the telescope completely the wrong way around that makes one despair of the degree to which the contemporary church can call itself Christian. Well, there will be another sin, and in six months we get to be cynical about it. <laughs> we get to ask questions. <laughs> can, can I just, if we have time, I'd like to read a few, um, just a little bit from, uh, there's um, a man who's called uh, Will Jones, and every so often he publishes something really very helpful, and I, I recommend people. Oh, please, find, yeah. Find out. Um, the reason, uh, about an hour or so ago, uh, he sent this really useful document, and, and if, if people have got the patience, I'd like to read some of the principles and his comments. They're very short. They're three or four lines each. But what they do is they give, I think, chapter and verse for what we're talking about. They explain, uh, and, and this is a prelude to the Living in Loving Faith document. So he begins by saying, the Church of England at Synod today launched a new set of pastoral principles for what's called living together well. Uh, they're commended by the House of Bishops. They follow the uh, letters that the bishops of Oxford and Lichfield sent to their dioceses, which we talked about last year. So in a sense, it's those were the icebergs breaking the water at the top. And now here comes the rest of the iceberg. Um, here are the highlights with, with commentary. So the first principle is welcome people as they are, rather than offering a welcome that's dependent upon individuals' willingness to conform to a way of thinking and being that's perceived as the norm. Will comments, this appears to rule out bringing standards of contact to bear in discipleship. In other words, you mustn't bring the Bible to bear, to bear in any of this. Uh, the second principle, you should, have, un, you should have unconditional positive regard that it was without judgment or question. There is ambiguity here in what this means. To be biblical, we do need to distinguish between a person and their conduct, and that's missing. Third principle, acknowledging that unintentional subliminal actions or language can convey powerful messages. This is the psycho babble of, of, um, uh, of unconscious bias, um, which, which psychologists have proved to be complete nonsense. And, and Will says quite rightly here, um, Points like this seem to be written in a kind of code directed at what are perceived to be the exclusionary habits of conservatives. In other words, it's get off our back, uh, you wretched, bigoted people. Another principle, a willingness to respect different difference so everyone feels they belong. Comment, there are no limits set on the difference here that must be respected in order to facilitate the only goal mentioned, which is a feeling of belonging. I mean, belonging to what? On what basis? Uh, the, the, we're back into the kind of therapeutic affirmation, of course. Well, and so on. There, there are six of these. Let's just read one. Sacraments are God's gifts, not ours. We receive them at Christ's invitation and his alone, which means the church is absolved of any role in discerning who should and shouldn't be admitted to communion. You see how it goes. Uh, right. and, and this this is, uh, foundation is too strong a word. But this is the swamp uh, on which the Church of England is now 
building itself and it, of course it will give way because no if you want therapy you better go and pay for some good therapy you don't need therapy with religious icing on top because it's bad therapy and the religion stinks what you want is a christianity that will save you and transform you and and and, and they're, they're offering something very different well they are they don't believe in transformation no they all repentance yeah or, I... or holiness or, or <laughs> truth in the biblical sense or love in god's sense yeah. they believe in all those words used in a categorically different sense <sighs> it's tricky <laughs> it, it is tricky it, <laughs> it's difficult, but but the trouble is it, it's you know, Kevin what's really upsetting here is that is that the, the the whole of our culture and society is beginning to enter into a conspiracy of word abuse you know the whole diversity tolerance inclusion thing all these words pretend to mean one thing and mean another and now the church of england is doing the same thing using words that pretend to mean one thing always did mean one thing but now mean something else it's a form of trickery no it is it, here's what's happened the church of england has become a hoax church yes i think so you i'm know, really it, sorry I, i'm so sorry but but it really has i i've been quite upset as i've watched synod on 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 the internet and i've i've wondered why i've been upset and and the answer is because i i was on i was on it for 20 years i was i i gave myself completely to the church of england and and i've lost something incredibly precious and what i have to tell myself is the thing that i've lost doesn't exist anymore and that, that even if i was there it looks the same it has the same name some of the faces are the same but it's gone it, it, the, the, there was a real attempt to be Christian, I don't know, in, in the last in the last thirty years. But in the in, in the somewhere in the last decade, it has morphed into something really completely different, and and it's it's actually profoundly upsetting. So although I may seem to be laughing at it, and, and, and some people might say being cynical, although I'm really asking questions, it's done from a place of really serious pain and loss, and I I, I think. I, I I think we speak also with the mind of Christ because they've changed Christ's words and Christ's meanings. Without being too flippant, you know, when with the coming persecutions in Christianity, uh, certainly going to hit the shores of England in the next dozen years or so. You guys should be uh, happy with the Church of England that you're not going to be filling up any uh, prisons because you're Christian. So you're safe that way. All right, Gavin, what a great, uplifting <laughs> fun show. I just, after this morning's technology, I'm looking at the monitor. Yeah, clearly I've not been able to set up anything. I look like I have liver disease of some sort. I'm all yellow. I'm not really yellow, but that's what it is. I'm Gavin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 491. We really are getting close to 500. It's exciting on the 22nd of February, 2019. Thank you for your patience. Pray for us who are sinners. Pray for the truth that may be spoken in love. <laughs>